In July 2001, St. Mary's University and Atlantic School of Theology signed a memorandum of agreement to become affiliated schools. A result of this affiliation is the establishment of the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs. Situated on the AST campus in Halifax, the Centre undertakes collaborative research and education on ethics in partnership with the major shapers of public life, government, the business community, NGOs, and public service agencies. The Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs has started a series of open lectures that engage the public's imagination about ethical practice in business, finance, science, and the law. The following lecture comes from this series of public events. Welcome to part two of our five-part lecture series, Trust in Science. In organizing this series, my colleague Gordon McEwitt and I at the History of Science and Technology program at King's have been very fortunate to be able to work hand in hand with Frank Schwartz, Executive Director of SACEPA, and Janice Graham, Canadian Research Chair at the Department of Bioethics at Dalhousie University. As such, this series is a joint venture of four institutions, King's, Dal, St. Mary's, and the Atlantic School of Theology. Welcome to representatives and members from those institutions with us tonight, and particularly Richard Goldblum, Chancellor of Dalhousie University. As was clear from our first lecture, way back in October 26th, which was filled to overflowing, and then some, at King's, as those of you who were there can testify, the issues being addressed by this series, Trust in Science, resonate with concerns shared not just by students and academics, but also by the general public. Indeed, this is part of the reason why CBC Radio is here taping the series for possible broadcast on ideas, and why Eastlink Television is here recording each event for continuing rebroadcast on local cable television. In our first lecture, Professor Stephen Shapin reviewed key features of how trust in science evolved from the 17th century to the present. In doing so, he highlighted the tensions inherent in our contemporary distinctions between what science knows about the natural world and what we ought to do with that knowledge. Compared to earlier periods in history, modern science no longer claims for itself the same degree of moral high ground or authority to speak about how we should live, what we should do with what we know. Truth about our world, scientific fact, what is the case, has become separated, rendered an inquiry essentially distinct from the moral question of what we ought to do with that knowledge. As Professor Shapin put it, is statements have become distinct from ought to statements. But if scientists by their very nature are trusted to over are trusted to seek truth about our world, and they are not judged but and they are not judged to possess the ability also to oversee the ethical and practical applications of their work, then who is? The politician? The general public? Do scientists not, after all, have a responsibility to direct, to direct us in what we ought to do with the scientific knowledge that they provide? 
Steve Shapin left us with such questions and with a tantalizing story, particularly in the context of 20th century US history, of how military and political authorities made the division between what is kind of knowledge and what ought we to do kind of knowledge. They made that division absolutely and indeed career-threateningly rigid. Scientists were invited to exercise their authority to make is statements, to tell truths about nature, especially how to blow up cities with an atomic bomb. But they were silenced when trying to exercise practical, moral responsibility in making ought statements. Should we drop such bombs? Should we even build them? Tonight's lecture by Dr. David Scadden touches on a different kind of bomb, the area of embryonic stem cell research. As you all know, here is an area of research in which questions of what do we know about nature and questions of what ought we to do with that knowledge are inescapably linked, being implicated in social, moral, and as we've seen recently, even political consequences. But tonight we enter also into new territory for our lecture series, the territory of trust within science itself. If science and scientists are high-ranking authorities for our society concerning the truth about nature and about ourselves, what happens when there is error, disagreement, even outright lying, as some would put it, within the scientific world? If we citizens of the general public trust science, entrust ourselves to science, what does it mean for us that within the scientific community itself, overt fraud can and does occur? Tonight's lecture is entitled, The View from Within. Does science trust itself? I invite my friend and co-collaborator, Frank Schwartz from SACEPA, to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker. Frank. Thank you very much, Ian. And good evening, everyone. I have been given the onerous task of introducing Dr. David Scadden, who is uh, this evening's speaker. And I use the, uh, the term onerous quite advisedly because I don't think I can do it in the 30 minutes that I've been given to do it. That's, that's a joke, by the way. Uh, but there is some, some truth to this. Dr. Scadden is an impressive individual, and he has an impressive record of achievement. And I will only, go, I will only gloss over it uh, because it really would take a half hour if I, if I had the time. Uh, Dr. Scadden is a Jordan Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, which is perhaps the only chair uh, endowed chair in stem cell research in, in the US. We don't know of any others. Uh, he's also co-director of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, director of the Center for Regenerative Medicine, and chief of hematological, uh, hematological malignancies at Massachusetts General Hospital, co-director of uh, AIDS Research Center, and on and on. Uh, in addition to his degree, or before his uh, degree in medicine, people will be uh, interested to know that his first degree is in English literature. And I understand it's a, we have some applause here. I understand he's quite, you can ask questions about stem cell research and, and is it Keats? Or Yates, sorry, Yates, so we, have to, we have to do that. Uh, he's board certified in internal medicine, medical oncology and hematology. Uh, he's author of over 90 original research manuscripts and 60 invited book chapters, editorials, reviews in all of the, all of the top journal. He's on review boards. Uh, he's won numerous rewards, and again, I would urge you to look at uh, many of the websites on which these are profiled. I really don't want to mention too many of them at this stage, uh, and has numerous uh, uh, honors as well bestowed upon him. So he's uh, obviously a first-class uh, scientist, and uh, we look forward to, um, to hearing what he has to say. Uh, 
Uh, I should note that almost exactly one year ago, in December of 2005, Dr. Skadden was interviewed on uh, PBS newscast about the scandal resulting from the data fabrication at a very well-known uh, lab in, um, in Korea. And during the interview, uh, I watched the interview with Dr. Skadden, so I've, I've got the quote. Uh, he said, in response to a question about how such a thing could have happened, he said, quote, science is really based on trust, like most other human endeavors. And I thought that was quite interesting. So Dr. Skadden has obviously thought a great deal uh, about the situation and what has happened, and he's here to help us understand possible responses to tonight's question. Does science trust itself? Dr. Skadden. I really do appreciate the very gracious introduction. Thank you very much. And uh, I need to thank the uh, institutions who have invited me here, King's and Ian Stewart and Gordon McQuad, uh, Sasepa, Frank Schwartz, and the Department of Bioethics and Dalhousie University. So thank you all. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, my daughter was a student here and uh, loved her time at King's. So it's great to be able to come and, and see some of the places where she had uh, the opportunity to learn so much. One of the things she told me she learned in this room is that uh, biology is not for her. So I... <laughs> All knowledge is good knowledge, and uh, that's an important thing. It's also great to be in Canada, where uh, stem cells really, uh, in many ways, got their uh, start. So it was the definition, the empiric definition of what a stem cell is, came from work in Toronto. The definition of the cancer stem cell also came from Toronto. So uh, Canada has a strong legacy of terrific stem cell research. It's great to be here. It's particularly great to be here given what's going on south of the border. And um, Ian, if you wouldn't mind adopting me, that would be great. <laughs> I have to say, uh, one of my favorite stem cell scientists is John Dick from Toronto. And uh, we were at a meeting together in, uh, in Israel. And one of our hosts decided to give us a walking tour of Jerusalem after midnight. And as we're walking through the um, Palestinian quarter with uh, armed Israeli guards walking around in flak jackets, John Dick gave me a crash course in O Canada. So I'm... <laughs> very important issues. Now, uh, what I wanted to talk about, and Ian asked me to come speak, not because I'm an ethicist, I'm certainly not. Uh, and I, I really, well, Frank generously said I, I have thought long and hard about this. I really more live the day-to-day -day of science. And I wanted to tell you just about the way I think about the issues of truth in science. Some of the examples that have come up in the area that I'm particularly interested in, in stem cell biology. And I think those are areas that are of relevance to all of us because we are uh, so attuned to what's happening in stem cells because of the potential for that science being able to truly transform the, the, the face of medical care. So um, I, I just wanted to speak a little bit about my perspective as a practitioner and to some extent also as one who continues to observe the way science is taught, both as a teacher myself and also through the way I've seen my children introduced to it in uh, their uh, lower school training. And I have to say one of the things that I find disturbing about the education in science is that very rarely have the opportunity to enable people to see the tremendous joy, tremendous creativity that's a part of the scientific process. They were often introduced to it as really the history of discoveries rather than the process. And for me, science is all about the verbs. It really has a tremendous dimension to it of discovery that is really in some ways unfortunately undermined by uh, the nature of our early education, at least, in science. And in fact, the, the way it is practiced is really through the ability to see small bits of information and then trying to construct those into more of a narrative form. That process is invariably interpretive. That involves clearly a dimension of creativity on the part of the investigator. And that, that has certain limitations in, implicit within it. If that interpretation is a fundamental part of acquiring new knowledge, then, frankly, that uh, also lends a bit of the, um, uh, the subjective to scientific knowledge itself. And certainly the lens through which a scientist views the information is much colored by their personal experience, the experience within the field, the particular culture they come from, the enduring myths within that culture, and, of course, the scientist's individual character. 
Now, one of the wonderful things about science is that it only really is accepted within the context of truth when it's been verified by a fellow scientist. That something that is discovered anew and presented is always intriguing, but frankly depends upon validation through another uh, work. And that has, to some extent, the self-cleansing dimension to it. That it is really through that, uh, that process of interaction with others that uh, the, the, the false falls away, but the true also has a chance to be reshaped. It's shaped now again through the interpretive lens that that person provides to it. And so while science is often thought about in terms of simply lifting a veil and providing an insight into something that is hard, true, and fixed, it is really much more a dynamic process than that, at least as viewed through the eyes of someone spending time doing it. That um, I recall my father used to ask me, a man who was uh, very energetic and very results oriented, used to call me periodically and say, what did I discover today? <laughs> there was always a pause after that. And um, you know, it's really, there are very few eureka moments, at least in my lifetime. I think we've made some reasonable discoveries, but they're based not so much on suddenly having the clouds move away from one's eyes, but uh, rather to be able to assemble things into to, to a, a comprehensible order. Uh, it's really often, I think it was Einstein who said, it's not really the moment of Eureka, but it's rather a scientist might say, now that's curious. And from there, one starts to do the interpretive process to understand and create what ultimately, if validated, becomes scientific truth. So I want to uh, just express to you a little bit about why, how this is an ongoing issue. And even though we can apply quantitative means to some of these processes, they still remain somewhat ambiguous, partly because of the limited background which we have when we're bringing to this new knowledge. So I was, I'm going to ask you to go through a little bit of a thought experiment with me. This is related to a problem that's actually ongoing in my own laboratory and in areas within uh, the stem cell field. And it has to do with blood stem cells. Now, we've known a tremendous amount about these cells. These are the first cells that were really identified as stem cells. It has been 50 years. We have been using them in a therapeutic context in the setting of cancer and blood disease for now over five years. And it's tremendously successful. But frankly, we still only see these from really the most, in the most shallow depth. And one of the issues that we still don't understand is where they live. So we know they live within bone. Yours may not be green, but, I, but uh, they are uh, within bone. You'll have to give me some creative license here that uh, this is representative of bone and bone marrow, which has a extensive amount of vasculature within it. And it's only been in the last three years that we have any sense of where within the context of this mix of bone marrow that you've all seen following a turkey dinner, uh, where, that, where would you find the stem cell? that you really cannot tell a stem cell apart from its descendants, yet they have a very distinct biology. They perform in the way that no other cell performs, and I'll mention how in a minute. But one of the questions is where do they live? Because that will help us in understanding how we might be able to modify them. One of the things we've been interested in is do they have an association with bone? Because we know we've developed lots of drugs for bone disease recently. And one of the questions we work on is whether or not some of those drugs might be repurposed for the treatment of people with blood diseases. And we are actually finding, finding that to be the case. But one of the questions is, if you see them associated with bone, are they only there? And they're not. It turns out that there's recent evidence, as recent as this year, that suggests they're actually in great abundance also around blood vessels. And so one of the questions is, well, what's important? What really controls them? And that's an ongoing debate. It's partly based on this issue of just seeing them in this static image. Now, you might say, well, of course, this is going to be very important in regulating them. But a bit of information that would, might, might change your opinion is the fact that we know these cells circulate tremendously. So at least in the models that we use, the animal models that we use, the mouse, virtually their entire mass of stem cells, which is measured in hundreds of thousands, will circulate during the course of a single day. So they're constantly trafficking. So to put this into a more realist, a more uh, of a context that would be comparable to what others might think about, maybe this is just a professor having too much time one Saturday afternoon on his hands. But if you think about, okay, so now you're coming from outer space and you are looking at something that you know is going to be important, maybe not as important as stem cells, but 
uh, that there are these small rectangular shapes that keep circulating around cities. And you'd like to know what regulates them, what's important in sustaining them. Well, if you looked at a static image, you'd say someplace like this, which only has a couple of cars associated with it, it's not going to be terribly important. But a place like, oops, like this, where there are many of them, that's going to be the critical area. Now, of course, if you lived in Boston, you'd know that if you needed gas, you'd go there. And unfortunately, every day when you go out of work, you've got to pay your money there. So the way you interpret this information is largely dependent on knowing other issues. You have to know about the kinetics of movement, something we don't often see when initially examining tissues, for example, in a, in a, in a fixed section that we look at under a microscope. So interpretation clearly shapes the truth for us in terms of what is important for these elements within a, the context of that simple example. Now, the way truth is shaped is very different depending on the nature of the science. In life sciences in particular, it has an opportunity to be um, uh, perhaps stretched or made different. Uh, and that is in part because it is such a, a unique field and that it really is in many ways a stress test for the integrity of the scientists. Because this is uncharted territory, so knowing the background issues is still very, very limited. And also, frankly, the stakes are incredibly high not just because this is a new area of science, but clearly this is an area of great interest to the public, and particularly the public affecting, affected by chronic disease for which we often have very few therapies. So that becomes a type of pressure on scientists. It's manifest actually in terms of funding because those agencies are often providing support for the scientists, and they need to respond by providing information back. No one wants to give information back about a failed experiment. In addition, there are very high stakes commercially. While we don't know exactly how stem cells will be used, we know that they will ultimately be a part of medical therapy, and that usually is, has associated with it tremendous wealth generation. And so the idea that private industry has a great deal of interest in this and puts pressure on its investigators is, is something that's, that's quite real uh, in entrepreneurial settings. It's also very real in uh, state-supported agencies, and that's particularly true in some countries. And of course, the fact that this is highly visible. One doesn't need to do very much in the stem cell world to have a reporter become interested. Sorry, any reporters? But I, you know, this concept is something that, one, that, that is generally very intuitively appealing to people. They recognize its potential power. And because of that, it really does put a certain amount of strain on what are the usual means by which information is vetted and filtered through the usual investigative process. Now, I want to go through two scenarios that I think are uh, revealing in terms of the way that information has been used and misused in the context of stem cell science. One of them it actually, to me, points out one of the great virtues of the scientific method, and it is in the saga of so-called transdifferentiation. I'll explain that more in detail later. And then the second is, of course, one of the most nefarious misuses of science, and that is the, uh, the area that uh, Frank was mentioning of Professor Huang in South Korea. So just to give you a bit of background about stem cells, and now I get to get into my comfort zone a little more and talk about the scientific dimension. These are a very unique subset of cells, and the reason they're unique is that they have two signature properties. One is this capacity. As an undifferentiated cell population, they actually can spin off cells that can become virtually every differentiated cell in the body. Now, that power is something that is clearly tremendous and has the ability to uh, form a whole individual. It's also what is required to maintain tissues. So if you or I was uh, suddenly, uh, we were unable to make uh, new cells because we did not have stem cells, our lives would be measured in the order of about two to three weeks. So stem cells are a critical component of the ability to sustain life. Now, how is it that they do that? It's not just that they're capable of producing the more mature cells that go through the so-called differentiation process. But when they divide, they also have the possibility of making one of their daughter cells go on to this differentiation specialization, but one of their cells actually becomes essentially an identical twin of what it started as. It is a self-renewal program. And that balance is something that maintains this stem cell population as a durable cell population that can last the decades, or we hope, century and more of life. And the interesting dimension of this is these two features. Now, that's very different than virtually every other cell type in the body. 
But stem cells are not all equal. There are different kinds of stem cells, and they are very much associated with times in development. So in the human, following fertilization, within the first few cell divisions, there's a so-called population of cells that are totipotent. And that means they can become every aspect of the body, including the extra embryonic parts of the body, things like the umbilical cord and the placenta. As soon as the, uh, the cells start to become about two to 300 cells in mass, that's something that occurs in the first five to seven days following fertilization. During that interval, there's a small collection of cells up at the top pole here, which is called the inner cell mass. And if those cells are isolated, they have this ability to be pluripotent. They can become all the different tissues that make up the body. And if you put them into a Petri dish, you can grow them out, and they are so-called embryonic stem cells. They are embryonic stem cell lines when you are passaging them and continuing to maintain them over time. But these so-called ES cells are, of course, the very important, powerful, and controversial area. They have been demonstrated to be so powerful, <coughs> excuse me, that in animal models, <coughs> individual cells from this group could be tucked back into one of these embryonic stem cells, uh, sorry, one of these blastocysts, and it will contribute to every tissue type within the body of that animal. Now, while these are called embryonic stem cells, the cells that are formed when, the cell, when this structure starts to take on any shape, so when it starts to have, to invaginate, become, go through what's called gastrulation, uh, it's already starting to change in terms of what the cells can become, and they become much more restricted in what they can form. And they really take on what's called multipotency, which means that they're limited to a particular lineage of cells. So for example, a blood stem cell can make the tens of different uh, blood cell types, but it doesn't have the capacity to make intestine, or it doesn't have the capacity to make brain. So those are so-called multipotent cells, and that's what we refer to as adult stem cells. Now, both of these names are misnomers. This structure, a blastocyst, is actually a pre-embryo. It's at the time prior to this structure actually embedding itself in the wall of the uterus, in the womb. And so it is actually a structure that's often wasted in nature. It's also a structure that is formed in settings of in vitro fertilization clinics. And it is often, at least in the US, not implanted. When family planning is done, these can be just kept in the freezer, they can go to being discarded, or they are often volunteered for, uh, they're donated for research to create these embryonic stem cells with the hope that that might ultimately in some way manifest the life-giving potential of these cells through the development of therapy. Now that's clearly something that only some people are comfortable with and not others. But in any event, this is truly a pre-embryonic cell line but again, the vernacular is embryonic stem cells. Similarly, adult stem cells don't just come from adults. They can also come from very early fetal forms. Now, the difference between these two, uh, some of which I've mentioned, the, this embryonic stem cell has two states. It either self-renews entirely and only does that, and does that very rapidly. So you can actually make many, many of these cells. You can create new ones. You can grow them over long periods of time and get huge numbers of cells or you can change the conditions in which they live and they can become many different cell types. And in fact, at least in animal models, they can become all different cell types. Now, in the human system, they were first identified uh, in 1998, and we have been able to only work with these in limited capacity. The ability to understand these cells is still extremely primitive. You grow them under conditions where they, they are able to self-renew, or you change these conditions in very crude ways and they become a group of specialized cells. Now they can become some very interesting specialized cells. This is just a setting from a lab, our laboratory where if you are watching them, they can start to acquire characteristics that might remind you of other tissue types. And I don't know if you can see it pulsing, but basically a portion of this group of cells has taken on features that very much resemble a heart cell, that it will pulse in that manner. Now, one of the dimensions of this is that while the pulsing cells may be very important and interesting, what may be going on next to them is that a cell type will be becoming something like kidney or hair. So the idea of being able to create a very interesting subpopulation of cells, but to do it with sufficient purity still remains, frankly, a great challenge. Now we are making progress with this. I'll just mention one other experiment ongoing where we can take cells, get them to become specialized in the form of, say, a blood vessel forming cell, 
And we've been able to tag these. So they will have a green tag. They are human in nature. And you can actually test the way they will function in a living organism by transplanting them. There are strains of mice that don't have an immune system. And so these animals will actually accept a graft of a human cell type. So what we did is we grew some of these cells that had features of a blood cell, a blood vessel type. We dispersed them as individual cells and we implanted them into one of these mice. Now we thought maybe the cells would just die, maybe they would form a tumor, who knows what they would do. But what they did in quite interesting manner was that over a course of a seven to 10 day period, they actually organized themselves into structures that resembled blood vessels. And in fact, they managed to integrate themselves into the blood vasculature of the animal. So I think you can see here that, I can't see it as well, but the mouse blood vessels are red. Those that came from the human cells that we cultured are all green. And I think you may be able to see the, the blood pulsing through. So there's a tremendous ability of these cells to start to actually take on shapes very relevant for areas in therapy, very encouraging in terms of thinking about how we might be able to move them forward. So they have lots of different interesting characteristics. They can become all different tissue types. They can grow, be grown indefinitely. And because they can be grown readily, we might be able to genetically modify them. Thus the tremendous interest in the embryonic stem cell. Now that is very different than the adult stem cell type, which as I mentioned, has a more limited differentiation capacity where if it came from blood, it can make blood, but it can't make these other tissue types. It also frankly grows very slowly in the body and there are relatively few of these. So while we have something on the order of 10 to the 14th cells in our body, we only have on the order of about 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth of these. Now they go on to make 10 billion new blood cells every day. So they are an incredibly productive cell type that even a hedge fund manager would like, I think. But uh, they do have, we only have a small number of them and being able to grow them outside the body is something that's still very limited. One of the interesting elements of this science is that we're starting to appreciate that it's not restricted to things like the blood, that there may actually be stem cells in other tissues and it's now been accepted that these are in fact in the human brain. Something that certainly when I was a student was a laughable concept uh, and now is something that's very well accepted. And they really do serve an important function in maintaining some cell types within the brain. And one of the questions is, do all tissues have these cell, stem cells? Do all tissues have them in a way that we might be able to ultimately manipulate them so they might do a better job of organ repair? These are still completely unanswered questions. We still don't even know what tissues have them and which don't. Now, one of the issues that's come up is within the field, we'd like to know if we can possibly get the same kind of powerful cell, a so-called pluripotent cell like the embryonic stem cell, but maybe be able to do it from something that doesn't have all of the ethical quandaries associated with it. Can we derive it from an adult cell type? And some have said, we'll just use umbilical cord blood. And just as a point of information, this is actually an adult stem cell. While it comes from an earlier form in life than a fully formed adult, it actually only has capacity that is so-called multipotent and resembles an adult stem cell and really doesn't have any of the features of an embryonic stem cell. Now, the issue has come up of, well, maybe we can still take advantage of what these adult stem cells can do and maybe push them across the divide here and make them more embryonic-like. And that's a big challenge in stem cell science. It's also a huge home run if it happens. And so there's been a lot of pressure to try to accomplish this. And part of our interpretation of the data that is related to this is of course colored by our experience. The experience in part is something important in science that has been very well vetted. That is a, some really beautiful experiments by now Sir John Gurdon, who back in the 1960s did some experiments with frogs, with Xenopus. And what he showed is that he could take a frog egg, these are very substantial cells in size, and if he exposed the cell to UV light, the nucleus, the so-called, uh, the DNA containing brains of the cell, would actually disappear. That it uh, just, uh, the UV was sufficiently damaging that it was no longer viable. And what he did then was he took a part of the frog's intestine, you'll have to forgive my bad artistry here, um, but um, looks like one to me. And then he isolated an individual cell from this intestine. So now a fully formed frog took one cell, took its nucleus out and put it into 
the, the egg. And what happened was he was able to get a tadpole. That tadpole was able to grow up and become a frog. That frog was able to have baby frogs. So um, it really was a beautiful experiment that these nuclei, the DNA, can be reprogrammed. It can be something as fully formed as an intestinal cell. And yet, its identity can be completely reshaped. And this notion of cells having a particular identity, cells truly do have an ego, that they will only be maintained as the cell type they became in development. And it is very difficult to get them to change their fate. It's one of the reasons why, if you injure yourself, what grows back is skin and not tongue. Uh, so there is a, uh, a, a, a necessary <laughs> memory in cells. It's critical for, the be for being able to sustain the integrity of the organism. But, Sir John Gurdon showed, now we, there may be some plasticity. So that meant that uh, really some of the basic tenets of this heritability of identity could, in fact, be modified. And that has been then shaped by another spectacular experiment by uh, Ian Wilmot. And he may actually be Sir Ian Wilbert now as well, at the Roslyn Institute in, uh, uh, in Scotland. What he did was he took an unfertilized sheep egg, and instead of using UV light, he actually used a fine pipette. And unfortunately, the video wouldn't work on this. But this is actually a glass pipette through which there's suction applied. It's holding on to this egg. This tinier pipette has a sharp end. It gets with a, uh, a fine device. You can insert it into the egg and basically take out the nucleus. You can steal the egg's nucleus. What will happen is then you'll basically have this membrane-enclosed bundle of cytoplasm, all of the goods that are an important part of the function of the egg, but without any of the brains that tell it what to do. And interestingly, what he then did was he took from a U memory gland, he took the U's memory cell, and it's important to remember that this was a memory cell, took the nucleus and transferred it into this enucleated egg. And what happened was that basically that transfer resulted in the reprogramming of the nucleus. Reprogramming by the, by the, the, the uh, technology of somatic cell nuclear transfer. A somatic cell is a differentiated cell type. It's basically all the cell types that make up the body except the sperm and the egg. So taking the somatic cell's nucleus, transferring it into the egg. And what he showed is that, that the used DNA in that new cell was reprogrammed sufficiently so that it could start to actually divide and take on this shape of the blastocyst. And from that, it could be implanted in the womb of another sheep. And that resulted in Dolly. Now, Dolly originally had a different name. It was known as a particular numeric designation. The handlers were so impressed that the donating tissue came from the memory gland that they named her after Dolly Parton. <laughs> so, but Dolly is, again, a very important example of a rather spectacular, fr frankly surprising experiment that showed you could completely reprogram mammalian cells. So with that background, the notion of reprogramming was something that had been very well validated, and frankly, no one disputed it. Shortly after that, there were some rather interesting findings that came out of experiments that were being done both in human and in mouse. And one of them came from the setting of bone marrow transplantation, where there were people who had received a transplant from a donor that was their relative. So in this case, it was a woman who had received a bone marrow transplant for her leukemia, from her brother. Now, of course, receiving it from her brother meant that the cells that subsequently became the blood-forming cells in her body had her brother's genetic material, which included the Y chromosome that is associated with maleness. So you can examine tissues for the Y chromosome. You can do a process that's called FISH, in situ hybridization, using a fluorescent tag that you can see under a fluorescent microscope. Now, this woman then had complications in the liver, had a liver biopsy, and the liver biopsy was subsequently examined by Neil Thies. And what he found is that these cells that are glowing green here because they contain bile pigment, so they're clearly cells that are part of the liver, had the stain that marked for the Y chromosome. That meant 
that that came from, those cells came from the donor, came from the brother. So that was very interesting. Then there were a series of experiments done in mice. This is a series of experiments done um, uh, in Oregon. We're basically taking an animal model of an injury. This case was also a model in which there was injury to the liver. And now transplanting it with cells that were derived from another mouse. And the beauty of working with mice is that you can uh, provide genetic tags in the cells. And in this case, the genetic tag was actually something that would allow you to stain the, the cells blue if they were derived from the donor of the bone marrow. So the recipient was transplanted and started to make blood cells that had this blue pigment. The liver was then examined, and it was found to have these regions where this is just at the, to the Tories in various team journals, suggesting that indeed this process was ongoing. Now, there are lots of other interpretations for what might have happened. And you don't have to uh, be a scientist to think, well, maybe it's just that there was a, a residual pluripotent cell left over from embryonic development that could be there. Maybe actually the cell reverted back to an immature cell. Maybe it did go through transdifferentiation. Maybe they just joined forces. Or maybe actually there was just a liver stem cell hiding somewhere in the bone marrow and that the bone marrow re may represent the mother load of all different cell types. Because in fact, there were now reports where the headline, where the, the, the uh, uh, what was on the, the banner of what the, the paper was about was blood into brain and then brain into blood. And all of these issues suggesting, and in fact, really quite showing quite a bit of enthusiasm for the idea that transdifferentiation, that reprogramming was occurring. Well then, again through the lens of perhaps more skeptical colleagues, the data was being revisited and issues like this started to be of more concern. That here's a cell, but it and and there is a, a tag for say the Y chromosome, and indeed this cell now had two of them. And one of the questions was, well, that shouldn't be the case. And so investigators began to look at whether or not a different mechanism was at play. And the truth of trans differentiation became something that was challenged and actually then subsequently essentially debunked. And that what was really occurring is a process that no one really thought was very likely to be ongoing in many mammalian tissues, but that there was actually a fusion of cell types. And it didn't just mean that these cells were either static or would die, that with in fact two sets of nuclei, they could in fact grow. So that was actually rather surprising. It was something that, again, because the truth of this system is essentially one that is constantly in play, that it does take, it does get shaped, it does get reinterpreted over time. So now the field largely accepts that fusion is the most common event. Some of these still may occur, but with incredibly low frequency. And it's largely accepted now that fusion is the most common process. Now, that, of course, says that interpretation is an important part of it, of our understanding of, of fact and, and science and truth, and that it can be subject to reinterpretation. Now, my take on this is that's actually a wonderful dynamism to the whole process and does suggest that, indeed, with enough interaction and enough communication among scientists, that ultimately we do get to something that is a more accepted and uh, validated truth. Now, there is also this issue, though, that times of great intensive interest in a field can challenge individuals' character. And while I'd like to say that, my, that I am among a group of, of people who have impeccable characters, that, of course, is not true. Uh, and there are those who have misused the trust of their colleagues. And that is, uh, to some extent, based on what is, again, the tremendous power of one of those experiments, the Ian Wilmot experiment, of being able to transfer a nucleus, use somatic cell nuclear transfer to create a blastocyst. And what he did was to implant it and undergo this so-called reproductive cloning. There is another way in which this blastocyst could be used, which is very much like what I introduced early on, which is that you might be able to isolate these cells, grow them in a dish, and they can become embryonic stem cells and then you could potentially use them in different ways. That process is sometimes called therapeutic cloning. I can't even bring myself to write that, actually, because that cloning, unfortunately, has such associations with people's sci-fi image of reproducing characters that you might not like to ever see again, like 
Donald Rumsfeld, for example, <laughs> that um, there is a, uh, a need to change our language, I think. And so it's reprogramming is what's really going on. And the idea that you might be able to do that for therapeutic purposes is something that is, uh, is a, a very appealing dimension of this type of work. And so the idea that you might be able to make human embryonic stem cells from nuclear transfer is something that has been of tremendous attention. And the reason is that if you could envision that you might now take a nucleus from a patient cell, say a skin cell from an individual who might have a disease for which we understand very little and have even less in terms of therapy, something like ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, where um, if you might be able to take the DNA, sorry, the nucleus from a skin cell of that individual, we know that DNA contains all the information that was ultimately an important part of their getting the disease. If you put that into an egg and you were able to then get a new cell through the blastocyst that could then be used to create an embryonic stem cell line that was essentially representative of the patient and the disease that they had, that you might be able to create cell types that would be of particular appeal. So in this case, this example rather, of someone who had ALS, you might be able to create the type of t nervous tissue that might give us for the first time living cells in a dish that could represent the process that's ongoing in the brain. We can't sequentially sample the brain of individuals affected with this disease, but you might be able to recreate some of the processes in the laboratory. And the power of that would of course be enormous. It would give us for the first time true models of disease that would be very valuable in terms of understanding. And if it was something that you wanted to do, like replace the cells, we know that this cell type would essentially be identical immunologically, and so it would not be rejected. So again, the therapeutic power of this is enormous, both from the pr perspective of being able to understand and also being able to ultimately use them in transplant. But there's another aspect of this, which is that if you can use these embryo and stem cells from an individual, that has a disease, these patient or disease-specific cells might then become the specialized cells of interest, say the nervous tissue, which could then be used in so-called chemical or drug screening strategies, large scale, to be able to get you, to be able to allow you to test many different kinds of drugs or chemicals to see whether or not you might be able to interrupt the process that could lead to the destruction of the cells that are an important part of the disease. And that, of course, would be leading to drug development. That's an enormously powerful concept for the commercial sector and was frankly one of the very big issues in South Korea where the notion that uh, this might create and spawn a whole area of life sciences technology and the, uh, the companies that came with it was something that was tremendously um, appealing and was one of the reasons why the investment was so extreme. Now that leads us to what happened with Professor Wong. A little bit of background about him. He is, was a gentleman of relatively modest means as, uh, when he was growing up. He went into veterinary science and was uh, involved in some of the areas related to trying to basically uh, do the animal husbandry necessary to get high quality farm uh, animals. And he was also working with nuclear transfer for these animals. He then uh, recognized that this was an area of tremendous interest. He was getting a tremendous amount of support. He got $3 million to do the work. And um, he then reported that he was able to actually do this. And he was not only able to do it in a way that was impressive because of it was a demonstration of proof of principle, but then he very shortly followed on with a report that he was able to do it with small numbers of eggs to create relatively well, good numbers of stem cell lines, and that these were lines that were generated from people with diseases of interest, things like diabetes. So this was regarded as a breakthrough. And Frank mentioned that uh, I was on a, a show about the uh, devastating consequences of Dr. Wong's, um, his, his fraud. I was on the same show saying how wonderful this was when, <laughs> when Dr. Wong initially reported this, because this truly did represent something that we thought this will be a spectacular step forward. Now, what was also very interesting is that Dr. Wong was continuing to demonstrate his skills in other animals, and he created Snuppy. And for some reason, that was also regarded as a huge development, not for some reason. I mean, this is actually, it's very difficult to, to uh, work with dogs. So different animals have very different success rates with this nuclear transfer process. 
But this made Dr. Huang, frankly, a, a, a folk hero in Korea. He really did become one of the, uh, Time Magazine had named him as one of the great uh, you know, innovators of, of the year. He was uh, regarded as something of the first science rock star. And uh, he had a free first class pass for life on Korean Airlines. So uh, he was living well. And was, frankly, someone that uh, all, many of us in the field knew and, and respected. He seemed to be a very modest man who uh, was uh, inviting scientists. We sent scientists over to learn his techniques. They had no doubt that what he was doing was something that was of, of high quality and high integrity. And then suddenly things started to unravel. They unraveled, actually, largely through the press, to the credit of the press. They somehow sniffed out that one of his colleagues was uncomfortable. And he uh, in indicated that, gee, there was something that was amiss. And he revealed that to one of the journals that had published his first report, saying that it was unintentional. It was a misuse of some of the photographs. Um, it was then, not very long thereafter, that South Korea, uh, uh, yes, that should be SKU, sorry, uh, concluded that the data was faked. And um, interestingly, that Snuppy was the real thing. So he clearly had the talent to be able to do this. Um, this was also something that was so devastating, and people were so concerned about this, that um, there was massive protest against the unfair treatment he was receiving in the press, and there was even someone who decided to light themselves on fire. Now, it wasn't long thereafter that he admitted fraud, and the egg donors decided to file suit, and he was subsequently indicted on three charges. So he had gone from being someone who was a, a rock star in the field, someone who had seemed to be providing us with true transforming uh, technologic developments. And yet uh, this quickly unraveled. And I have to say, within the scientific world, this was regarded as something that was um, just painful in terms of the, the hubris that it demonstrated. And here's an enduring myth that you all know, that uh, the great, the great uh, technology developed by Daedalus was abused by son Icarus, who flew too close to the sun, melted the wax, and lost his wings. Uh, and that notion of having a, uh, an opportunity in science and to misuse it is something that, of course, is sub is all are subject to. Uh, we depend on the integrity of our colleagues to be able to make sure that they, uh, they abide by the rules. But there's also another dimension of this, which is that the sun is very bright in science when it comes to having fake data. Because if it's an important experiment, and certainly this was very important, people will try to reproduce it. If they can't reproduce it, you're just not gonna stay afloat. That he will, that you will definitely fall. And when fallen, once you give up your integrity in science, your ability to get grants is essentially zero. You're often banned from them, as he is. And uh, your ability to ever publish your work is also lost. So you essentially give up all that was of value and all that uh, made you a, a contributor to the scientific arena. So why would somebody do this? It's really quite striking, actually. Uh, and I can only, using my dime store psychology, hypothesize that this was a person who had great success in this arena. And he had dedicated himself, invested a lot, and his nation was investing in him tremendously. He knew that someday someone was going to break this technologic barrier. And I think what he felt was, he's close enough, he wants to be first. And just assumed that by the time other people got around to trying to reproduce it, he would have really solved the problem. Of course, that hasn't been the case. No one's been able to do this still to date. And the big problem is not so much that his work somehow changed our conceptual, our thinking about the field. Rather, it was regarded as a technologic breakthrough. But in its absence, we basically revert back in time to now still needing to try to accomplish this technology or trying to do it through alternative means. But it didn't really, in some ways, rock the scientific world because it was regarded as an individual who had gone awry. And while these same tasks would now need to be achieved, that people were continuing their business. They hadn't so much changed what they were doing based on what he had claimed. Now, one of the most remarkable things about this, though, in my mind, is that Dr. Wong has now reappeared in court defiant and confident. So uh, it is clear that hubris has no bounds. Um, so the lessons from this, I would say, are that 
whosoever quote this was, is indeed true, that knowledge is a combination of faith and reason, and that at least in the life sciences, truth is something that is evolving, that it is only near absolute, and that it really is a communal exercise, at least in the science in which I participate. And while the, the process of science is one that I think uh, does help codify and, and, and help purge uh, untruth, it is a very imperfect code, and it is something that still we are likely to continue to see either misinterpretation or, uh, frankly, false information being provided. But scientists, I think, accept that this is a, a, a process that is imperfect and that we will find the way through. Um, one of the other issues, and I never thought I would quote Ronald Reagan, but the idea that essentially trust but verify is, in fact, the mode by which most scientists operate. That while it's very exciting to hear of new data, and certainly we'd like to build upon that, we also have an obligation to first validate that the conclusions are indeed correct. And then, of course, finally, that truly hubris has no bounds. Now, um, this issue then that Ian asked me to address, of does science trust itself? Well, I would say that there is a, a trust that's necessary to be able to function in science, but that we also recognize that the process is inherently problematic that there is interpretation invariably as, that is a, a central part of the process of discovery, and that it will require verification, and therefore the science does have an ability to self-correct. Now, it's also the case that uh, we all recognize that though scientists are incredibly exciting, dynamic, creative individuals, they're very flawed. Uh, and I count myself among them, but in any event, uh, I, I will say that I think in general in the scientific community, there is a, a general uh, a high uh, regard for um, uh, colleagues who are willing to take creative leaps. There is also, however, a significant deterrent for those who take creative leaps with the truth. And the good news, again, is that the process does have some self-correcting dimensions to it that I think ultimately make it very powerful. And I would only hope that the non-scientific public would recognize that it is very uncommon for a scientist to claim absolute truth. And one of the issues, unfortunately, is that when transmitted through the press, that it sells best as copy if it has the most definitive boundaries associated with it. And um, yet the qualifiers very rarely show up in print. They are a part, however, of the scientific community. And uh, certainly I hope that you'll regard scientists as those among you who should be regarded uh, as of shared, of shared goal, and that the idea is to try to provide something of greater benefit for all of us. Thank you. Appreciate your time.